I feel the most beautiful when I remember my body is not a thing to be looked at, but a moment to enjoy. I feel the most beautiful when I'm singing or laughing, when I'm telling the fucking truth. We want to extend a huge thank you to Ergo Baby for making this episode of What's Underneath possible. Can you share how you're feeling right now in this moment? Feeling really present with the knowing that me as an individual is an illusion. I'm not one person. Really, I'm my children, and I'm my husband, and I'm my friends, and I'm every creature that's fed me, and I'm every song that I've ever sung, and I'm every song that was sung into me, and I'm every book I ever read. To be here at this moment, I'm the one who gets to sit in the stool and talk right now. <laughs> so can you talk about what your style says about you? The way that I dress, it has within it an invitation to be whoever you are. That's what I hope. I like this because I always feel like representing the cosmos. I bought this for my husband at like a knockoff Forever 21 in a mall. You know what I mean? This isn't, it's not like woven by, you know, <laughs> it's, it's just made of plastic, but it reminds me that I am made of stars. And everything I like to wear the most always has a rock in the pocket. My firstborn, when he was like three years old, he started to put rocks in my pockets and I wouldn't know. And I love it because I don't think I'm a particularly grounded person. I think I'm a little more astral than grounded. And so that literally a, a stone in my hand or in my pocket reminds me to come back to Earth. I'm Everywhere like sad to have you take off your cosmos, but I think that is the next The natural. next natural. Yeah. So can you talk about assumptions that people make about you? based on your appearance? Oh, people think I'm like a huge pothead. Any <laughs> party I went to, people would always be like, oh, she doesn't, you know, skip her. She doesn't need any because she's already hoo-hoo, you know? <laughs> and literally, it's just the way I absorb the planet. <laughs> Noises are loud for me. Lights are bright for me. Faces are like suns. Sometimes I can look and sometimes it's too much. It's just always been true. My natural state is awe. I am in a perpetual state of awe <laughs> that I'm alive and that you're here too. The fact that we don't all just sit around constantly saying to each other, <gasps> I also have, have had a lot of shapes in my life. I was like a, like a 300 pound person for a lot of years of my life. And there was enormous satisfaction and sanity and pleasure in having that body. And then it needed to change. And when it did, I was treated so profoundly differently. And then the body of a mother. When I lost my first baby, when I had my first miscarriage, which was the beginning of me becoming a parent, I felt deeply lost. Because I really believed that this baby was, was mine. But now I know that all of your babies are yours and never yours. You don't necessarily get to hold them. You don't necessarily get to be liked by them. <laughs> you know? The only thing you definitely get to do is love them. And now I know that my breasts, exquisite as they are, <laughs> don't have enough of the glandular tissue to make enough milk to feed my baby. I can't tell you how bad I wanted it. I want it right now. I still want to be able to do it. And I'm so sad that I can't. And so when I give my baby a bottle, Sometimes I'm criticized for not caring about bonding with my baby or not caring about the, you know, breast is best. So yeah, I think people maybe assume things about the kind of parent I am. And uh, let them. I know who I am. What would you say has been your biggest struggle? Whoa. Well, I've had a lot of them. If I had to distill it, it's that love isn't always enough. Love isn't a fixer. There's a lot of mental illness in my family, legacies of abuse, and all the grown-ups in my life came from the sort of island of trauma. And all the alcohol to find a way to get through a day, all the things they did to not have to grieve, all the people who hurt one another and were hurt as babies and who grew 
and survived. I'm born into this. And what was done to them, they did not do to me. But still, what I was raised within was husk upon husk of terrible trauma. There's no one in my family that I don't love and empathize with. And still, I'll probably never be in relationship again with quite a few folks. I really care about the truth, that we're not pretending something never happened. So if what I need is for us to honor the truth of what happened with each other, and what they need is peace from that, privacy from that, then we've got an issue there. And now that I'm a parent, I see that. I would like to only offer the very best parts of my story. But every secret feels like a tumor. My big job is really the big job of re-metabolizing all the horror into some new possible spark of beauty for the next ones. That's my gig. So what would you say is like the biggest insecurity that you're working on? I have this wish that my body would be one thing and stay one thing. But of course, the body is constantly changing. Bigger, smaller, losing hair, getting hair other places. You know, everything's changing, 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 changing. And that's hard for me to feel always surprised and out of control around what I look like. I got really big probably when I was a teenager and then stayed big into my early 20s. Being a 300 pound person, a lot of that had to do with a really comforting relationship with my mom and food when my dad was at his worst and then left and she had been terribly sick. She'd had a really terrible series of infections. And so we'd eat, man. We'd watch Murphy Brown and the nanny. We'd make a pound of pasta, we'd eat the whole thing and then we'd make popcorn and we'd each have a candy bar. And it was one kind of relationship to food that at the time we really needed. My experience of fatness was my own and a lot of it was really joyful and whole. I miss a lot of things about it. I love that I had to take up space. It forced me to never disappear, even when I wanted to. I loved my fat rolls. I think I looked great. I liked the way that I looked. I was absolutely hated by a lot of people, <laughs> you know? I would get spit on. People would drive by in their cars and yell, you fucking fat bitch, you ugly whale. And then I was also hit on, very sexualized. And at that same time, I started to travel by myself. I remember this sensation of shedding, but it was like shedding skin. I was really starting the big work of disentangling what was my mother's story from what was my own story. I never tried to lose weight. I, my pants fell down one day and I went, oh wow, I think something's changing and I got new pants and I didn't think a lot about it and then it happened again. I had adventures that were more exciting than the comfort of food, I think that was part of it. But everyone thought I had you know, disordered eating when I was very fat, but I didn't have a dis an eating disorder till I got thin. Well, I had lost like whatever, 150 pounds or you know, a lot of weight. Then for the first time being in a thin body, I was subject to the conversations that thin people have with each other about you know, the, micro, the parts of your body that need to shrink or grow. The idea that your body can be separated into parts and measured and evaluated for its worth. And I started to starve myself. I would run 15 miles on a fucking treadmill and then I'd binge and binge and binge and binge and binge. I did that thing for a while. People just perceived me really differently. And when my body changed, it was like we had bro I had broken our agreement that I was gonna be the friend that looked like this and they were gonna be the friend that looked like that. If you're not my fat friend, I can confide in at this party about my romantic relationship and you won't judge me. Little did they know I was fine as fuck. They were using me, but they were incorrect. I used to go to this gym when I was a fat bodied person. People treated me however they treated me and I just thought, oh, this is the gym. And then I came back a year later and I had really, really changed. They didn't recognize me. And they were like, welcome. Like, do you want like special measurements taken of your body? And here's a bunch of free samples. They took a picture of me on one of the machines because they wanted to put it up on like the community board. And the, right, the conflict is right there because on the one hand I was like, 
they want to take a picture of me and put it on the board. Especially, I was in my 20s, you know, I was, I was more turned on by that idea than I would be now. Where are you now and also like, what did healing from eating disorder, how long did that last? You know, I had lost the weight really quickly and I remember being really scared that I would wake up and it would all be back. Like I'd eat one meal and everything would change. I don't know why after finding so much joy and fatness, amnesia, like it was gone. And I bought into the idea that it was scary and bad. And then I met my husband at a party. And about two days later, I checked myself into treatment. When I got back from this treatment process, we went on our first date and then we got married three weeks later. And that was 15 years ago now, two kids later, you know? So now I can say that and people aren't just like, oh, so you're about to get a divorce. You know? <laughs> he was somehow an enzyme in my life and I wanted to be well. It was worth it to me. And really it was about getting close to myself and his presence making me feel like I could do that. When do you feel the most vulnerable? I think it's always vulnerable to talk about what you love the most. It's what you love the most you want to protect, too. When I tell you what I love, I tell you what I am. What do you love the most? My babies, my husband, my family, the wild song of the world that I hear and that I think my job on the planet is to sing in response to. See, this is my whole story. All this extra skin I have from when I was big that will always be here. All this like soft tummy I have that my little boy loves. Even the like the tooth I'm missing from when we couldn't afford real dental care. So we just had to yank it out, you know? And the gray in my hair. It's like, it's the whole book of me. When do you feel the most beautiful? I feel the most beautiful when I remember my body is not a thing to be looked at, but a moment to enjoy. I feel the most beautiful when I'm singing or laughing, when I'm telling the fucking truth, when I'm not thinking about looking the most beautiful, when I stop thinking of myself as something to be seen, a thing to be seen, but instead remember the truth of myself as you know, I'm a verb, not a noun. <laughs> I get to do. Okay, so last question. Why in your skin, in your body, in your journey, why is it a good place to be? There have been a couple of times in my life where I've wanted to die. And I don't anymore. I really want to live. And I'm so lucky that this body gave me children gave children to the world and gave songs to the world. I'm incredibly strong and that's a gift to my body from my long line of ancestry all the way back to deep water fish that crawled up onto the land. Is there a wild song of the world that you'd like to share with us that you hear right now? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What a gift. The whole thing. I'm dizzy. <laughs> we want to extend a huge thank you to Ergo Baby for making this episode of What's Underneath possible. Ergo Baby is a company that's supporting your growing family through every step of the parenthood journey. What did you use to carry me when I was a baby? I'd have to wrap you really tight in a blanket or somehow put you inside of a shirt. I would have loved to have had something like Ergo Baby's baby carrier. Ergo Baby's newborn carrier, the Ergo Baby Embrace, is now available in soft air mesh. Soft, cool, and comfortable. It's the sweetest way to stay connected from the start.
On your next Ergo Baby purchase, use code STYLELIKEYOU15 for 15% off today. Thank you for watching this week's episode of What's Underneath with the radiant Abigail Bankson. For more interviews like this, subscribe to Style Like You.